Uh, Today we'll be reflecting on scripture from Isaiah 9, verses 2 through 7. So the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when, when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace. For the throne of David and his kingdom, he will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onwards and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Our hearts and minds are open. Amen. Uh, Have you ever uh, wondered why it's so hard to find peace in the world. You know, in our life, peace is something that, that we all crave. It's something that, that we all want to strive for, but it's also something that has eluded us throughout history. Uh, one of the challenges has been that we define peace by the way of the culture rather than the way of God. You know, historically, uh, humanity has defined peace as the absence of war. And when we kind of take that definition and apply it to our uh, social life, or our normal life, so to speak, our individual lives, we, we tend to define peace as the absence of conflict. Um, the problem is that's not how peace is talked about within the sacred scriptures. Uh, in the ancient Jewish culture, peace w- was talked about with the word shalom. And shalom had a multifaceted uh, way of thinking about things in the world. It was more than just the absence of war, the absence of conflict. It was about making things right, making things whole, being complete. Not just with oneself, but also with the community around them. You know, today in our second Sunday of Advent, we're going to look at how shalom is not a passive thing. Shalom is God with us, which means we can strive for peace. Uh, In this Isaiah passage, a a child is born, and, and this child is called three things, one of them being the prince of peace. The child comes with the expectation to set things right. The expectation of bringing shalom, well-being to God's people. Isaiah speaks uh, to the human condition in so many ways. If you haven't spent a lot of time in Isaiah, I encourage you to do it because uh, it gives us such a rich way of looking at how God works in our world. Here in chapter 9, this text that Brian read for us is likely a poem that was written for the coronation of a king. Uh, The context in the chapter which this is speaking of is the siege that the Assyrians had placed on the Israelites. And, And the Assyrians were brutal in the way they would conquer other civilizations. Uh, This meant that people were displaced from their homes or driven out into exile from the land entirely or even murdered. 
had a profound impact on the people, creating a sense of despair, a sense of loss, a sense of brokenness. And this passage uses the images of light and darkness like so much of our holy scriptures. You know, from the, from the very beginning in Genesis 1, where on the first day God created light. All the way to the end of our Bible in Revelation 21, where God provides illumination for a new creation. For the people of Isaiah's time, they were in the depths of darkness. They were in a place that they could not imagine how they would even dig out of it. And yet, Isaiah says to them, a baby is set to be born to make things new. Now, reading through the lens of Jesus followers, we automatically jump to Jesus, right? Being that baby. And and there's no wonder because we know the rest of the story. We know that Jesus is the Messiah that has come to set things new. The thing is that the people in Isaiah's time would not necessarily have read this as a messianic text. And when we jump straight to Jesus, we skip over 700 years of God working with his people. Uh, For example, Hezekiah came, and Hezekiah worked to reform everything and, and worked to bring the people out of that darkness. God's hand was at work in ancient Israel. God's hand was at work when he sent Jesus to live here on earth, and God's hand is still at work today through you and me. We all have a role to play. Jesus didn't come so that we could just sit back and passively critique everything that's going on in the world around us. Jesus came so his followers could make a difference in the world. Shalom is not a passive thing, which means we can strive for peace. You know, life is not just a series of accidents that make up where we are today and who we are today. What what makes how everything will turn out are the things that we do in our life. It's our habits that shape our lives for the path that we are going to be on. You know, what we do in our life can either bridge the gap and help us become closer to God knows that we can be, or it can make that gap even wider. One of the great myths of the church is that transformation happens overnight, that it happens in an instant. And we know that that's not how transformation happens. We know that transformation happens by us doing small things over time, and it will will make a huge difference. Look at the people uh, in Isaiah chapter 9. Chapter 9 is a long way from the end of Isaiah. In, In fact, from the time these words were written to the time Hezekiah helped bring the people out of that darkness was about 75 years. We forget that shalom, true peace, is not the absence of conflict, but rather a state of completeness, a state of moving to something better. Shalom is the journey or walking with each other through life, just like Brian was talking about with our prayer cards. 
I want to talk about a few things that I think that can help us be people who shine that light of peace to the world. Uh, First, for us to be people of peace, we have to strive for the present. Psychologists uh, tell us that human beings struggle with, with having our brains stay in the here and now. Often our brains are stuck in the past. Right? Why can't things be like they were when we were kids? Man, technology is just changing the world absolutely way too fast. Think about those folks in our story today. They, they've lost their homelands. They're being brutalized by the Assyrians. Yet Isaiah says this to them. Let's put Isaiah 9, 2 on the screen. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness on them, light has shined. Isaiah points to the here and now. You remember that was 75 years from the time that was written to the time it came to, to, to they got out of that darkness. And Isaiah says, the light has, not the light will, the light has shined. How many times Have we been stuck in the past or preoccupied with what's next and have missed what's going on right in front of us? I came across a story about a dad who was um, uh, taking the kids to school. It it was his turn, and, and he had a lot to do that day and lots of meetings, and he was really frustrated because he knew this was had the possibility to just mess up the whole day. So he got them, you know, together real quick and got them to get in the car real fast and he started off to school. And he got really frustrated because he was behind someone who was going just super, super slow. Now, the guy was like, we don't need to speed and cause a wreck, but you also don't have to go 20 miles below the speed limit. So he decided to take a shortcut. And he takes this shortcut and he gets up to the train track and wouldn't you know it, the lights go off and the guardrail comes down. And he just starts ringing the steering wheel because he knows this is it. This is what's going to make me late. And so he's tapping the steering wheel and thinking, okay, how can I make up time? How can I get through this? When he hears from the back seat the sweet, sweet voice, Daddy, Daddy, we're so lucky. We get to watch the train go by. Children, they're so good at living in the present, aren't they? They're, I think they're so good at this because they don't have as much mental clutter as we do. You know, just think about that guy. He had all this in his brain. How in the world am I going to make it happen? Why is this guy moving too slow? Oh, no, a train. When we strive to live in the present, we need to swat those thoughts out of our brain. What if instead this guy made this ride more fun? Did you know that uh, before kids start driving, the average parent spends about five to 10 hours a week driving kids around? What if he used that time to build memories, sing some fun songs, or have a conversation about faith with his kids? You know what? He would have gotten to work at the exact same time as he did when he was stressing out to get there. But he would have had a whole lot more peace in his mind. Another thing that that Shalom just calls us to do is to strive to get moving. Striving for peace in your life is not rocket science. It's not so much about what you know or what you believe to be true. It's about taking that next step and moving forward. It's really just that simple, (laughs) but it's not that easy. For, For better or worse, what we do says more about who we are than what we say. St. Francis of Assisi said this, you you might know this quote, preach the gospel. And at all, preach the gospel and at all times, I'm sorry, I can't speak today. Preach the gospel at all times. And if necessary, use words. 
What he understood was, was that when we live by our values, people notice. The hardest part of doing anything is getting started. It can be overwhelming to decide what to do. In fact, I suffer what, what I've heard being called is analysis paralysis. You know what I mean? I'll just look at it each and every way. And the problem is, is when we think about how to be a person of peace, we think about these grand actions. When that's not what it's all about at all. Here's another uh, St. Francis quote that I found this week about doing stuff. He says, start by doing what is necessary, then what is possible, and suddenly you're doing the impossible. Isn't that awesome? Just start. I want to encourage you this Christmas season, I want to encourage you to find something that you can be a part of to help bring peace. Maybe it's a neighbor that might need a little pick-me-up and you spend some time with them. Maybe it's making amends with a uh, friend or family member that you've gotten crossed ways with. Remember, you're not always going to get it right. And sometimes you won't be able to accomplish the task at all, and that's okay. The next best thing to do is to strive to do something. And if we're going to be people who embrace the Prince of Peace, we also need to strive for equity. You know, one of the challenges of our culture is is that we don't really separate the differences between equality and, and equity. They're, they're not the same. They both can deal with fairness, but, but they have some significant difference. For example, equality means providing the same for all people. Equity means providing according to what a person may need. Uh, I found this illustration. Do we have it back there? Uh, Look at that. Uh, On the left-hand side, you've got equality. Everybody has the exact same thing, right? On the right-hand side is the definition of equity. Everybody has what they need in order to thrive. Uh, We're going to be people of shalom, people who strive for real peace. We need to be people who help one another thrive, who helps get each other what we need. I have a really good friend uh, who has three boys. They're all adults now, but uh, he has two boys that are about a year apart, you know, 18 months maybe. And and then the, the third boy is about six years younger than the middle child, right? So you're with me on this age gap here. And one night, he's putting his youngest son into bed, and his youngest son starts crying. And he said, well, what's wrong? He said, you never let me stay up. My brothers get to stay up and do whatever they want, and I just have to go to bed at a certain time. He said, why can't I be like them? His dad looked at him and just went, well, I love them more. He said, he looked up at him and went, you do not. (laughs) But that dad knew that in order for his son to have peace, well, in order for the whole household to have peace, right? He needed something different. He needed more sleep. In our reading this morning, We read, his authority shall grow continually and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time onwards and forevermore, the seal of the the Lord of hosts will do this. And we understand through the teachings of Jesus 
that in order to get justice and righteousness, we have to be a part of helping people get what they need. Shalom is not a passive thing. God is with us. So we can strive for peace. You know, there's a lot of times that our world feels really dark. And and I don't know about you, but sometimes when you see the news, you, you think, is Emmanuel real? Is God with us real? Well, I want you to know that not just because I'm a pastor, but I believe it's true. (laughs) I believe God's with us. I believe God is real. I believe this because I get the privilege of, of seeing that through you guys. Through like the second Sunday, the angel tree angels are gone. by helping fly a family who lost everything, their house burned down and lost everything to California so they could be with other family. I I believe it because I get to see it. I get to see that God is still at work in the lives of people every day. God has been with us since the beginning working through people like Moses, who led the Israelites out of slavery. Esther, who saved her people by having the courage to speak the truth. By John the Baptist, who was willing to buck the establishment and pave the way for Jesus. In Acts, you see it in Tabitha, who in her strive to help the poor, helped People have what they need. Through Martin Luther, who reshaped the church and making it acceptable, I mean accessible to more people. Through John Wesley, who who shined a light on how grace works in the world. Through Mother Teresa, who cared for the most vulnerable in our population. I heard someone say one time about Mother Teresa, and it can be said of any of those that I just said, and and us. They said, Mother Teresa has the same 24 hours in the day that everyone else had. I want to ask you a question on the second Sunday of Advent. What are you going to do with the 24 hours that you've been given to help Bring the light of peace to those around you.